It is a pleasure for me to be in Memphis today and to be with, uh, with all of you. Uh, it's a privilege to join you in convening what I would consider an extremely important summit uh, to discuss and advance the groundkeeping My Brother's Keeper initiative. And it's a particular pleasure to do so here in the great city of, the great city of Memphis, uh, a city whose history is bound up in the work that we all gather here today to continue and whose future will be written by leaders especially the young people who are here today in this crowd. Now, over the centuries, Memphis has undergone a really remarkable series of, of transformations, from a hub in the immoral slave trade, helping to fuel a 19th century economy founded on oppression and built on the backs of those in our nation who were held in chains, to a diverse, inclusive, and thriving urban center, known for its legendary music, its vibrant, wonderful culture, and as I'm going to be taken back on the plane with me tonight, even better barbecue. <laughs> We're definitely going to get that barbecue. The Memphis of today is in some ways um, barely recognizable as a city it was just a, a few short decades ago, near the height of the civil rights movement when the, when the struggle for equality played out in the streets and in the national headlines. Yet the scars of this struggle and the lingering impacts of legal and institutional discrimination remain really all around us. Over the years, the changes that we have seen in Memphis have mirrored the ones that have swept across the nation, tearing down barriers and affirming the equality of all men and all women. And all of this progress has come thanks to the power of engaged citizens like each and every one of you, engaged citizens who care about this country. Also, the promise of America's founding documents is a clear, a clear reason why we are where we are, and the passion, the passion of leaders, like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Like so many cities across the American South, from Selma to Greensboro to Birmingham, from Tuscaloosa, where my sister-in-law integrated the University of Alabama, to Atlanta, to Meridian, Memphis is a home to a number of historic sites of great importance to the civil rights era. It was here in 1968, as you heard, that sanitation workers went on strike to call for, for high wages and for, for basic dignity and to protest discrimination and dangerous working conditions. It was here at the Mason Temple, not far, not far from where we now stand, that Dr. King famously declared, and I quote, something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening with our world. Something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening with our world. It was in that very same speech that he told us that he had been to, he'd been to the mountaintop and had seen the promised land. And it was here, of course, on that very next day at the Lorraine Motel, that's now museum, to the cause that he championed and the work that we all must continue, that Dr. King was taken from us far before his time. Now, in the decades since then, this city and our nation have taken really extraordinary steps forward along the road to civil rights and equal justice. And in that regard, let me, be, let me be very clear. To discount this progress would be a grave disservice to those who peacefully marched and organized and sacrificed so much to make it all possible. Yet it's equally true as we gather today that the work that these generations have left to us of forging a more inclusive future and building a, a more perfect union, that work is far from over. A great deal remains to be done. And as we speak, once again, something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening with our world. In recent months, with the tragic deaths of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Garner in New York City, we've seen, I think, the beginning of important national reflection and conversation. These incidents have brought long simmering divides to the surface. They have sparked widespread public demonstrations and they have focused a spotlight on the rifts that can develop between police officials and the citizens they are entrusted to serve and to protect. Now, none of these concerns are limited to any one state, city, or geographic region. They are American issues. They are American issues that are truly national in scope. They demand a constructive response from our entire country, and at their core, they are far larger than just the police and the community, implicating concerns about the fairness of our justice system as a whole and the persistent opportunity gaps faced by far too many people throughout our nation and by boys and young men of color 
in particular. Now, I know you heard, I know you heard from President Obama via video message earlier today, and I want to join him in expressing my gratitude and admiration for all that, that Memphis has done to assume a, a mantle of leadership befitting your unique history. Since the President launched my brother's keeper in February to address opportunity <coughs> gaps and to ensure that all young people can reach their full potential, the Obama administration has been relying on leaders like you to help make a difference. We have been joining with cities and towns, businesses, as well as foundations that are taking steps to connect young people to mentoring, support networks, and the skills they need to find a good job or to go to college and to work their way into the middle class. And we've been encouraged, really, by the great work that, that you're doing under Mayor Wharton's leadership to improve education, employment, health care, and justice. To help advance the work of our groundbreaking Defending Childhood Initiative and our National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. To expand mentoring and leverage new partnerships to, to increase access to post-secondary education. And to take up the My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge, an important call for communities to implement coherent cradle to college and career strategies for improving the, the life outcomes of all young people, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or the circumstances into which they are born. Now, all of this is vital, commendable, and I think extremely promising work. It has the potential to make a real difference in the lives and in the futures of, of countless Americans. As we gather this afternoon to advance it, to address concerns raised by peaceful protesters, peaceful protesters, and to rebuild trust where it has been eroded, I believe we also need to broaden both our focus and our impact. Now, make no mistake, out of the tragedies of the fast, past few months and weeks comes an opportunity for this great nation that we must not, as we have too often in the past, squander. We've had these opportunities before, and for whatever reason, we don't take advantage of them. Now is the time to have this conversation. Our needed conversation must result in concrete action. But we need to have that conversation. We need to dedicate ourselves to coming up with action to deal with these underlying problems. Last August, with these goals in mind, I launched a new Smart on Crime initiative to, to strengthen communities, to improve public safety, and to make America's criminal justice system more effective and more equitable. Our actions under this initiative are, are born of the crucial recognition that <coughs> Growing both tougher and smarter on crimes means investing in innovations. It means striving for more just and more equal outcomes and rejecting any policy or practice that has the potential to undermine sound law enforcement or to erode the sense of trust that must always exist between police officials and the citizens that they serve. Now, as the My Brother's Keepers Task Force reported to the President last May, and, and this was months before events in Ferguson captured the headlines, months before that, that task force told the president that we need to do more to strengthen the relationship between law enforcement and their communities. This was a part of my brother's keeper. America's law enforcement leaders must ensure that every community can see that we are firmly committed to the impartial and aggressive enforcement of our laws and the unbiased protection of everyone in this country. Bonds that have been broken must be restored. Bonds that have never existed must now be created, because this is the fundamental promise that lies at the core of who we are, what we do, and what so many brave law enforcement officers sacrifice so much every day to achieve. And this is why I've been traveling around the country in recent days and over the, the past few weeks, and I will do so over the coming months, to meet with law enforcement, faith, and community leaders to strengthen our dialogue about cooperation and mutual trust. And I'm pleased to note that we're holding the latest in the this series of meetings later today, here, right here in Memphis. And I want to emphasize that our, our shared dedication to integrity, equal justice, and the, and the highest standards of fair and effective policing has always been at the heart of the Justice Department's efforts in, in every sector, in every city, in every town that our work, our work touches. This is the dedication that drove me shortly after I took office as Attorney General to order an extensive review of the Justice Department's guidance regarding the use of race by federal law enforcement agencies, a directive that was issued by, by the previous administration in 2003. Uh, this guidance expressly prohibited federal agents from using race 
as a factor in their investigations unless, unless they encountered specific credible information that made race relevant to a particular case. But it did not prohibit the consideration of such factors as national origin, religion, gender, or sexual orientation, and it broadly exempted investigations and operations that implicated America's national security. An unduly, I believe, expansive exemption that was the subject of legitimate criticism. As Attorney General, I have repeatedly made clear that racial profiling by law enforcement is not only wrong, it's misguided and it is ineffective because it can mistakenly guide and focus investigative efforts, waste precious resources, and ultimately, ultimately undermine public trust in what it is that we do. Now, like some of you, this is something that I experience. I experience personally as a younger man in a very deeply personal way. I will never forget the frustration I felt at being pulled over twice and my car searched on the New Jersey Turnpike, even though I'm sure I wasn't speeding. I had a 1971 Plymouth Duster. That thing didn't have the capacity to speed. I love that car, but it wasn't fast. And I will never forget the humiliation of being stopped by a police officer who simply saw me running to catch a movie at night in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. It's a nice part of Washington, D.C. And stopped and asked me, what was I doing? Where was I going? At the time of that stop, I was a federal prosecutor. You know, a lot younger than I am now. The hair was a little darker. But I was working on a thing called the Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Division of the United States Department of Justice. But to that police officer, I was just a black guy in the wrong place, running fast at night, and he thought there was a basis to, to stop me. Now, these experiences bear out what research has consistently found, that when those who come in contact with law enforcement feel they have been treated fairly and that official actions are both appropriate and warranted, they are more likely to accept decisions by, by the authorities. People are more likely to obey the law, and people are more likely to cooperate with law enforcement in the future, even if they disagree, even if they disagree with specific outcomes. Now, this is especially true in communities where crime challenges are right there, are at their most acute, and where interactions with police officers are, are too often characterized by discord and by distress. And that's why I think it's incumbent upon Justice Department leaders and others in law enforcement at every level to help, bridge, to help bridge this divide. Because trust in the system and compliance with the law must begin not with the fear of arrest or even the threat of incarceration, but with respect for the institutions that guide our democracy and for the laws, policies, and, and the courageous men and women who keep us safe. Over the past five years, we have scrupulously looked at those 2,000 three guidelines with an eye towards ensuring that all federal agents can, can fulfill their core law enforcement, public safety, and national security responsibilities with maximum legitimacy, accountability, and transparency. And I'm here to report that this review has reached its conclusion. And we have determined that although the department's 2003 use of race guidance prohibited racial profiling in a, in a really broad sense, it's time to do even more. It's time to expand upon the safeguards that are currently in place. It's time to institute new protections for those who come in contact with federal authorities. And it's time to bring enhanced training, oversight, and accountability to this process so that anyone responsible for isolated incidents of profiling can be held responsible and singular acts of discrimination do not tarnish the exemplary work that's performed by the overwhelming majority of America's federal law enforcement officials each and every day. And particularly in light of the recent incidents that we've seen at the, at the local level and the widespread concerns about trust in the criminal justice process that so many have raised and continue to raise throughout our, our nation, it's imperative that we take every possible action to ensure strong and sound policing practices. We must instill the absolute highest standards of professionalism as well as integrity. And that's why yesterday I announced new guidance that will supersede the directive that was issued in 2003. And it will apply to all federal law enforcement agents conducting law enforcement activities, including when those activities relate to national security as well as intelligence. Now, this new guidance will expand prohibited profiling criteria by explicitly banning profiling based not only on race, but also for the very first time on gender, national origin, religion, 
sexual orientation and gender identity. It will apply the same uniform standard to all investigations, <coughs> national security operations, and intelligence activities conducted by federal law enforcement. It will govern the, govern the actions of every single FBI, DEA, and ATF agent, every United States Marshal, and every other federal law enforcement agent conducting law enforcement activities, including state and local law enforcement officers assigned to federal task forces. And it will include training, oversight, and accountability measures to ensure that all federal law enforcement activities and operations reflect our commitment to keeping the nations safe while upholding our most sacred values and the rights of all communities and individuals. Now, this constitutes a, a major and important step forward to ensure effective policing by federal authorities throughout the nation. It will institutionalize clear and critical strategies that are already in place in, in the field and are currently enabling us to protect the safety of our nation and maintain the trust of our citizens. And it codifies positive policies and practices that are now being observed by the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, and the United States Marshal Service. Well, today, I urge state and local law enforcement agencies to look to this new federal guidance as a model and to develop their own rigorous policies along similar lines. This will promote sound law enforcement techniques. It will help to move us toward the, the ultimate goal of ending racial profiling once and for all. And it will enable every American to have greater confidence in the mechanisms in place to hold their government accountable, to work in concert with law enforcement to secure their communities, and to make public safety not only an obligation for those who have sworn to serve, but a promise that's fulfilled by citizens and public servants side by side. Now, throughout the country, my colleagues and I are taking meaningful steps to make good on this promise and to expand our ability to protect and to empower all of our citizens. In meetings with law enforcement and community leaders like the ones I've convened in Atlanta, Cleveland, and as I said, soon here in Memphis, we're opening new lines of communication and cooperation through the efforts of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, which has opened more than 20 investigations and into public departments, public police departments across the country in the last five fiscal years, we're striving to correct unconstitutional policing practices. In conjunction with the President's recent policy announcements, reforming the way the federal government equips state and local law enforcement, particularly with regard to military <coughs> style equipment, investing in the use of body cameras, and promoting proven community policing initiatives, and engaging law enforcement and, and community leaders to reduce crime while building public trust. I'm confident that all of these efforts will help to, help to move us forward. And I can think of no better place to renew our shared commitment to this work than right here in Memphis. Following today's summit, I'll visit the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel, where Dr. King's room is preserved just as it was on the night that he lost his life. He knew when he arrived there on April the 3rd, 1968, that threats had been made against him. He spoke frankly about these threats and about his own mor mortality in the Mason Temple speech that was to be his last. He acknowledged that at the age of just 39, think about that, 39 years of age, he acknowledged at that, that tender young age that his life might soon come to a, to a violent end. Yet his optimism did not waver. He, his dedication to nonviolence and his adherence to non-aggression did not wane, and his unshakable belief in the divine, in the promise of what this nation could become, and especially in his fellow citizens, remained stronger than ever. Dr. King believed, as we believe, in the need for mutual respect and the power of nonviolent collective action. He recognized that nonviolence is the single best path to bring about enduring change, enduring change. He once wrote that promoting nonviolence and love is the only way, and I'm going to quote, to cut off the chain of hate. And he called us all to remember that, and I quote him again, that the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community, while the aftermath of violence is tragic bitterness. Well, today in this moment of challenge and far too much bitterness, let us reclaim these, these timeless principles. In this age of division, let us once more reach for peace 
In this hour of <coughs> darkness, let us live by Dr. King's shining example. And in this time of trial and great consequence, let us remember the assurance of his last public speech, that the power to achieve transformational progress lies within each and every one of us. Because in his immortal words, and I quote again, somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of the press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. And so just as I say we aren't going to let dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. We are going on, and we need all of you." Unquote. As we take up this work anew, as we address the challenges now before us, and as we meet the great struggles of our time, I want you to know that we will continue to need all of you in cities like Memphis to keep pushing us, pushing us forward. We will keep relying on you to honor the history of, of progress that lives in the hallowed places across the city and in so many other places across our great nation. And we will never stop working with optimism, with commitment, and without delay to build renewed trust and forge that more perfect union, that beloved community that remains our common pursuit, to keep walking together toward the promised land, and to do everything in our power to ensure that in every case, in every circumstance, and in every community, justice is finally done. Thank you. Thank you.